I believe you'll join us with your working suit on. <laughs> no, normally, some safety suits. No, no. Normally, uh, in Schneider, we have a protocol. Like, uh, mm. uh, I'm part of the central corporate team. So whenever we uh, come to the factory, we have to wear this special suit so that people recognize us that uh, we are not part of the plant team, but we are from within Schneider. But uh, you know, the other other entity employee. So that way. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, hello, everyone, on uh, the audience uh, joining us. So we have uh, truly, uh, Mr. Avnis uh, pointed out, we have truly a global uh, uh, webinar today. Thanks to Mr. Sudesh joining us from Dubai, and uh, Srikant is joining us from uh, Bangalore, and I believe Rahul also has joined us from Bangalore. Right, Rahul? No, I I am physically in Hyderabad. So to, means fortunately. This week I was available in Hyderabad because we are working on a project. So you can say that I am like physically in Hyderabad today, but I am located from Bangalore office. Sorry. So two Hyderabadi, two Bangalore, and and one from Dubai. Now, ah, okay. Yeah. So we'd like uh, so to the, all the audience. Uh, uh, you are on mute right now, but uh, you can communicate your uh, Q and A to us. Either using Q and A button or a chat box to ask your question, concerns, or solutions to us. No, and you can always use your uh, raise and option to talk to the speakers. Uh, today in the panel we have Mr. Sudesh Narayan, who is the founder and chief executive officer of uh, Knowledge Nail and Knowledge uh, Lens. Welcome, Mr. Sudesh. We have Mr. Srikant Aradhya. Uh, General Manager and Head of Business uh, Industry 4.0, um, Post in Engineering and uh, Business Solutions. Welcome, Mr. Srikanta. And also, we have Mr. Rahul Razukar, ASEAN and Regional uh, Lean Expert, uh, Snyder Electrics. Welcome, Rahul. Thank and uh, our moderator today is uh, Mr. Avnish Bhatnagar. He's Associate Director for the Product Management at uh, SSC Technologies. He is also a seasoned product leader with an industry experience of over 20 years with enterprise solution and product management. He has been a leading product management function at a mid to large scale B2B enterprise business. And he has been making impact while and at the same time making impact regarding the market share and the revenue growth. He's also very actively involved in the startup ecosystem as a mentor and uh, advising job startups and uh, startups around uh, uh, various parts of India, Hyderabad, and pressing them a sound go to market strategy, especially focused on monetization of ideas. And without any further delay, I'd like to hand it over to Avnish to take the webinar forward. Over to you, Avnish. Thank you so much, Vineet, for the um, for the the nice introduction. And I would once again like to welcome all the panelists. Thank you for taking your time out today um, and talking uh, on this webinar. I, I'm sure we are going to immensely benefit from your combined knowledge um, around Industry 4.0, which is what we are going to talk about today, especially in context of the innovation and sustainability. But before we dive into our discussion uh, for today, I would uh, request quickly if we can go around and uh, you know if I can uh, request to the issue starting with you to just give us a little bit of a brief about yourself and what what's your XP. I, I know it's very it's very difficult to ask you to do that in a in a short period of time given all of your um, immense background. But if you can just for uh, you know everybody's sake just talk a few lines about yourself. Yeah, I'll just uh, thanks uh, for giving the opportunity as such. Uh, uh, so uh, I've been uh, a software uh, veteran plus uh, industry IoT uh, journey for all my years. I started my career with uh, LNT as a commissioning engineer on the field. 
So working with power systems and so on. And then I yeah, quickly moved to software. All my years remaining has been software till I started the company uh, way in 2013. And from there, yeah, it has been a, a quite a bit of a journey working on sustainability, environment, and uh, uh, mostly on the industrial IoT segments right now. So that's kind of where it is. I work uh, quite a bit on uh, AI, uh, big data, cloud, blockchain. Those are kind of my area of expertise. Uh, so more of a technologist than anything else. Very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, um, next on, may I request uh, Shri Kanta? Can you can you please talk a little bit about yourself and uh, you know your what you've been doing at Bosch? So uh, first of all, I would uh, thank the organizers of this uh, summit. Uh, very nice topic you have selected, innovation and sustainability. Uh, myself, I'm Srikant Aradhya. I head the uh, Connected Industries group here, uh, especially on the Industry 4.0 business area. And I have around 29 years of uh, experience in manufacturing and IT. And I happen to be basically an electronics engineer with a software master's. And uh, I'm also very much in innovation. You know, I was heading the center of excellence in the industry in 4.0 and I happen to have received the 2020 Bosch Innovation Award for a unique connectivity product, uh, which I was developing with the team. And I also uh, support and mentor the startups. We have a program called DNA where we choose uh, some 20 odd startups and we mentor them on how they can be very viable both technically and business wise so that's my background thank you very much thank you thank you so much rikanta and now uh, rahul can you please uh, talk to us a little bit about yourself and what you've been doing rahul we can't hear you you're on mute Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. So yes. good afternoon. Good afternoon, team. So I am Rahul Vazurkar. I am working with uh, Schneider Electric India Private Limited. So uh, previously, I was working with Siemens and now with Schneider. So working with Schneider from past uh, uh, 14 years. So mainly, uh, uh, my core expertise is into industrial engineering, lean manufacturing. And uh, we also call within Schneider as Schneider Performance System. Like we have our own manufacturing system guide base, which is which is primarily driven from Toyota production system. So on the similar lines. So that is our core expertise that um, we work on all the capacity ramp up projects, lean manufacturing, industrial engineering, the new product and the new process launch, process design. And uh, from that approach now, so which was, which is mainly the lean manufacturing uh, technology, now we are also adopting the industry 4.0 applications into it. So all the automation and uh, digitization elements for which uh, we have our own products and our own solutions. Like when we say Schneider, uh, if you just uh, type eco structure solutions in Google, uh, you will have more understanding about what I'm talking about. So we have our own digital products solutions, which we are also applying in our own manufacturing process so that all our factories and all our distribution centers can become a showcase to our end customers. So just to explain a little bit about Schneider EcoStructure, uh, we have total six domains about Schneider EcoStructure, uh, EcoStructure plant, EcoStructure machine, EcoStructure power, EcoStructure grid, EcoStructure machine and EcoStructure IT. So these are the six domains which are uh, catering to the four end mar markets, basically. So building, data centers, uh, and uh, the grid technologies. And uh, how it works is basically we have, we had the products, but now those products are IoT enabled. Like in last uh, five to six years of journey, we have upgraded them along with our product development team as IoT enabled products. And we are fetching the data from there at edge level and we are pushing it to the apps and analytics, which is the third layer. So this is what we call is a, as a Schneider eco structure within our factories. And primarily, uh, not only me, but we have a team who is working on um, converting all the lean manufacturing processes to the smart manufacturing processes today. And globally, we are working upon converting our conventional lean manufacturing factories to a smart factory. So that is what uh, me as well as our central team, we are driving at. 
across all the uh, like we have more than 150 plants across uh, GSC International Region. So primarily we are uh, taking care of that part. Thank you, Raul. Thank you, and uh, thanks everybody for for the great introductions. And and in fact, Rahul, what you talked about gives us a great segue into my first question for the day. And you know, we I'll, I'll start with with yourself, Rahul, since you've talked about your transformation. When we talk about Industry 4.0 or 5.0 or you know what the the smart uh, working uh, environments. If, if I may ask you to compare between the traditional way of process automation or, or the traditional way of automation as we are used to versus when we talk about industry 4.0 or, or the smarter uh, environments, how, how would you compare and contrast from traditional to, um, to 4.0 in future? Okay, that's a, that's a very good question, actually. Thanks for that, Avnish. So, so mainly, uh, uh, traditionally, what, what we used to look at is only, you know, our objective was, uh, you know, either reduce the cycle time of the process for which we were leveraging the automation solutions. Like we used to leverage the robots or cobos or the pick and place systems or the running conveyors. Uh, so these technologies we used to leverage and the major objective was either quality improvement uh, or the cycle time reduction or, you know, any safety or ergonomic kind of improvement. So these were the prime preliminary objectives, uh, maybe in the traditional methodology. And, uh, but that was not sufficient because, um, you know, we were always working on the reactive modes. And now it has been changed to predictive way. And the predictive solutions will come only through digital solutions. And for and when we say that you know uh, our processes should be digital, and we should have all the data visible on the dashboard form, so it's not easy because um, uh, you have to rely on a lot of infrastructure, a uh, lot of IoT enabled products, the connections, the interaction between multiple systems. So there has to be a strong foundation, and there has to be a structured uh, vision or a structured uh, program. Uh, that is what we are driving at Schneider, wherein, you know, we are not working in silos, but we are working as a group. And there is a dedicated function uh, for all these, the adoption of all these uh, smart elements at global level. From there, we are driving the vision. So we have a company program and the company program gets evolved every year. And from there, the, the expectations or objectives uh, are set at plant or the distribution centers or at entity levels. And then it gets tracked and it gets assisted and facilitated from the central level. And that's very key element because uh, what will happen is if there is no standard guideline, uh, the, the peoples will work in silos and they will come up with multiple different different solutions and it will not promote standardization. So what we, what we do in Schneider is we, we do the POCs at one location at one side for each used case. And then based on the trials, based on the results, uh, that POC gets replicated at other locations. So that is the approach normally we follow within Schneider. And we have the standard, we have the standard use cases. For example, what you will see in Hyderabad factory, we have the same application running in Batam factory from Indonesia or Lexington factory from NAM or Lavodra factory from Europe. So across the globe, if you enter the shop floor, you will see the same digital solution. The production line layouts, the building layouts, uh, the, the apron colors of the operators. So these are the basic things which we were already at standard level. But when it comes to the digital element also, we have the similar kind of tools so that we are, we are following the same cyber security architecture. And then it becomes a little easy for the, uh, you know, when, when we fetch the data uh, at a common server from all the entities from the globe, then it becomes more simple. So normally that is what we are following at Schneider. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rahul. And, and that was quite insightful. And I, I, I do take away from what you said, the, the difference between the reactive to more predictive. Right. I mean, that's a, that, that, that's a, that's a very big element of that. 
if I may um, turn to you, Shrikantha, and you know, um, I want, my next question um, to you is that, you know, we we've seen this transformation to Industry 4.0, and uh, though it's, some would argue it's in its nascent stages, some would argue it's already happening out there in the world. Um, where do you see the next wave of innovation coming from? Do you, do you see that the processes, and I, I may qualify my question with, um, do you see that the processes will take some more time to mature at this point of time? Or do you do you see that and we are ripe for a disruption at this stage, you know, when it comes to specifically the innovation part? Shrikanta, you're on mute. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, Avnish, thanks for that Thank uh, very pertinent question. Uh, see, in order to understand uh, the possible point where we are in terms of an Industry 4.0 journey, we should realize that Industry 4.0 was a term coined in 2010 uh, in the Hanover Messe 11, rather. So we are already one decade into Industry 4.0, uh, Germany leading it with uh, few of the industrial giants in Germany, Bosch being one of them, Schneider, such people, they made a detailed framework in terms of what is industry 4.0 and such things. So much of the developed nations, developed manufacturing companies are already into industry 4.0. Uh, in Bosch also, we have a paradigm of two strategies, lead user and lead provider, where we develop industry 4.0 solutions for our own 200 odd companies. And once we perfect it there, we supply to other customers. So. Uh, it's quite clear that Industry 4.0 journey is already underway. Uh, many of the companies are already there. Uh, but looking at uh, what is the current point, uh, it depends on the maturity of a manufacturing company. You would also find uh, some of the manufacturing companies in uh, different global areas being uh, very much in Industry 3.0 or even less than that. Uh, but however, it depends on where the maturity curve is for a particular company. Normally, we take it in a four-stage uh, maturity look. Uh, for example, a company might not have got connected. The basic data might not have been acquired. So that is where uh, the connectivity layer or the basic foundation blocks need to be laid. And I think many of the companies did it uh, possibly five or six years back or even before that. The second uh, point of maturity comes in where uh, you start visualizing your data, you start building root cause analysis and diagnosis of your data, like what went wrong, what is the good KPI you are tracking, how much is OE now in real time. So that's the second curve of your maturity. And the third comes in where uh, AI kicks in, like my friend uh, Rahul was talking about prediction. So people, uh, when they're already past the first two areas, they don't look at what has happened or what is happening they would like to know what will happen or prediction. So many of the maintenance solutions, many of the quality solutions right now happening in industries are all prediction based in the sense that you are able to predict the remaining useful life of an element of the machine, or you are able to predict when your quality will dip based on your historical data analysis compared with whatever is happening currently. So that's the prediction where your AI and ML is much being talked of. Uh, but the fourth or the last step of Industry 4.0 or the holy grail of it is all about new business models uh, where you start disrupting the market. Uh, for example, this is one of the, them is a connected product thing. We are all used to product being sold in a capex way. That means you pay for a product upfront, buy it. Whereas uh, Industry 4.0 will talk of a product being sold as a service. And uh, we happen to have... Uh, done this uh, disruption or new business model introduction in the market. We did a connected tire project for a big uh, tire manufacturer in India, where the tires are connected and you don't buy tires in terms of uh, money, but in terms of the service, what they provide. We also did for a big battery manufacturer. You don't buy the battery in terms of volumes or numbers. You buy it based on how many hours of uninterrupted service it is going to give. But then if you are, uh, in this case, the user benefits because he's not buying uh, or putting a lot of capex uh, and the manufacturer benefits because then he gets an annual uh, recurring revenue. But to go there, you need to have completed your connectivity. Your product should be connected. You should be able to get data out of it. 
even remotely you should be able to monitor your product and possibly build solutions on top of it prediction solutions so i feel uh, the market is somewhere in between the prediction stage and the disruption stage so some of the early people in this game are already into getting into the disruptive market area coming out connected with connected products and such things uh, the people who are catching up are of course uh, in the area where they are looking at prediction looking at visualization and such things so the market is uh, i would say even the poised thank you thank you so much uh, shikandal we were very good insight about uh, you know we be in our virtual world of softwares we've already been talking about you know software as a service versus uh, the product and the capex versus opex but to see that um, as i say you know it's it's a mix of a virtual world we the software people live in a virtual world but this is the real world right and 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 co- combination of the two is is amazing and um, you have uh, a you terminology know, in industry 4.0 which we call it as a digital twin you have a virtual entity which reflects the real asset in all the ways so it's both very merging nice. of software and the physical things yeah. and and the physical thing absolutely absolutely very, very nice um with, with that let me uh, turn to sudesh and uh, you know my my question to you is you know it, interesting aspects we've been talking about predictive um, versus reactive and then um, you know making it more opex and there's always a, a dilemma of consumption the world over the economy is you know is, is encouraging more and more consumption and we are on the other hand we are talking about sustainability we are talking about the carbon footprints we are talking about the the climate change yeah, you know there is there is the, the the consumption consumption of power the energy crisis that we are seeing you know what what we are seeing in china happening and and everybody is in a race to find alternate sources of energy to to power our factories to power our, our our businesses so how do you see you know the aspect of sustainability come into this mix of you know as we started off with the with the industry 4.0 5.0 keeping our innovation cycle going encouraging consumption and at the same time doing it in a manner which is sustainable and which is in tune with our goals of uh, um, you know uh, net zero uh, carbon emissions any thoughts on that thanks thanks avnish i hope uh, i am audible as well uh, you so are, you basically are. Uh, it's a pretty uh, i would say cash 22 situation sometimes to say that yeah you are growing industrially fast enough uh and trying to disrupt the market uh, by creating lot more innovations and stuff like that at the same time uh, sustainability has to be focused around environment has to be preserved around net zero has to be focused we have to pledge to it and so on so so i think yeah it's a it's a complicated uh, uh, dynamics out there in the market right now but one of the fundamental thing uh, which has evolved in this whole space is first you need to measure it uh, so when we are talking about uh, net zero sustainability and all of those uh, the fundamental aspect is to measure what's the footprint uh, to start with on any industrial process or any industrial uh, activity or any growth uh, development whether it is industry 4 or you are doing it traditionally the so first fundamental thing is you measure it and then once you measure it you literally know what aspect really needs to be turned on and what can be accelerated what can be decelerated as part of the growth journey so so for that to happen so unless you connect your devices unless you connect and measure it unless you try and monitor it the the data asset is not created around it and unless that data asset is not out there the ability to say that okay i'm going towards net zero or i'm deviating from there becomes a fundamental challenge around so that's one dilemma which everybody has to look at it that industry 4 is assisting you towards that journey because first is fundamentally even if you look at connecting an energy meter and bringing that whole energy information on a platform and being able to look at what is your real net uh, carbon footprint is a very very critical aspect of it so so that's the f- one foundation like which i say which is very very critical to it the second aspect of it when we are talking about 
autonomous systems or we basically looking at efficiency optimization what are we actually trying to do so what we are trying to do is not only reduce the cost of the things we are not only improving productivity but indirectly what we are doing is we are trying to bring down the carbon footprint correct because let's say locking about a boiler efficiency improving efficiency by 4% what are you trying to do you are trying to reduce the footprint eventually because you are trying to generate a more productive output at a lesser input which is required to it and that's again a very fundamental for net zero to look at when we are talking about net zero people say okay i have to change the technology and do it yes obviously that's a journey to be adopted but fundamentally when you are looking at a brownfield project they are not going to change it overnight so the fundamental thing is they have to adopt by connecting first they have to adopt by integrating first they have to adopt by measuring first and once that measurement and integration story comes into play that's where the optimization and the ai driven interventions comes into play and how do you really curtail and advance to your net zero journey you know? so that's that's the connotation where i'm saying that sustainability and industry 4.0 is very very linked together it's not a disjoint solution that yeah, you embark on a sustainability journey separately and on an industrial uh journey separately industrial revolution journey separate it's a mix and they are going in the same direction only thing is as a leader and as visionaries you need to drive the decision on bringing those data assets together and making those intelligent decisions to bring down each of this so that's that's the thing which i see how the correlation between net zero and uh industry photo do really comes in because uh you can achieve net zero only if you are connected you are more organized you are optimized and you are trying to bring it down and you know where to really make a change so that's that's the way i see the thing coming up thank you thank you so much sudesh i think that's a, that's a very very pertinent point that you know when you when you measure when you know and that to you are you know uh, flowing that information into your processes that's where you can control you know? so that's that's the you know what we used to learn as the basic fundamentals of management who you cannot control which you something that you cannot measure so you know that's that's a, that's a very very pertinent point uh, out here um i i would like to go to rahul and see rahul do you, do you have any any thoughts on uh, you know how how have you at schneider seen any improvement in your carbon footprint or anything like that with the adoption of the newer technologies yeah so so normally uh, i i completely agree with what like sudish has mentioned just now and uh, the two two very uh, crisp uh, statements what he has made is uh, you need to have a basic foundation first you know so so that's a very uh, you know very valid and very important action you know you need to have all the devices connected you need to have the strong foundation like we all know that uh, we should have the the energy meters energy meters are capturing the actual power consumption today but uh, you know do we have the energy meters connected for each and every asset today who like we have plenty of assets on our shop floor whether he mentioned about the boilers the nuclear reactors those kind of things so so how many assets are today connected because it's not only you know connect one asset and uh, you know show that i am digital that's not the that's not the the requirement so one is about implementation uh, of the smart tools and second is also the adoption and the utilization tracking and that should go to like in the range of 80% to 90% to 100% range and there should be like what we follow in schneider is we have two different teams one team who is deploying the new solutions and another team who is tracking the utilization or the governance mechanism so that you know you have the uh, you have a good level of deployment and also the training to the people because you know uh, creating the competency creating the awareness on usage of all the new technologies and usage of all the new tools on the gamba today very less people knows about it in detail the mainly the utility team or the maintenance team they should be able to do the effective troubleshooting they so for that they should know that you know how this particular new technology works and for that they need to be trained on it so that is what we 
uh, we are achieving in schneider uh, by having these two separate teams where in we are also creating the competency the awareness uh, part so that the solutions what we are deploying are getting sustained and then talking uh, specific to sustainability so sustainability is a is a key driver for schneider so with respect to the co2 footprint reduction uh, we are also working on uh, the energy management solution so that is number one wherein we have our own solutions called as uh, the power monitoring expert and resource advisor so as i was mentioning uh, the power monitoring expert is a device uh, which is a edge layer device which is uh, fetching the power consumption data for each and every individual asset uh, from the shop floor from the uh, the control panel area uh, from the transformers from the inverters from the hvac systems from the air conditioning systems so wherever we have a power consumption so it is it is basically fetching the power consumption data and then it is pushing it to, to the apps layer the third layer which is resource advisor on the resource advisor we are able to understand that the which area is consuming more power and it will also talk about what action plans can be made to optimize that particular energy consumption at the same time the second element is water so in the water uh, we have all the uh, water consumption areas whether it's a canteen area whether it's a stp areas whether it's you know the manufacturing process area wherever we are consuming water everywhere there are digital water meters through which we are tracking the actual water consumption and there are flow operated the smart walls maybe our own solutions which will also uh, uh, recycle or recirculate the same water so that the consumption is lesser and the third aspect is like these are certain smart solutions i will say apart from that we have certain the other solutions because you know sustainability will not come only from digitization there are many small actions which are non smart actions and a simple actions like the electric vehicle utilization all the transport facilities like the employee buses uh, the inside mhc is in, inside the shop floor so we uh, i will not say that we are today 100% but we have started the journey and today we are uh, in the range of 15 to 20% on uh, utilization of the electrical vehicle like all our mhcs we are aiming to convert to electric starting from the employee buses to the, the forklift or the agvs and the amr so we have started that journey and we have a plan to go to fully 100% by end of year 25 so that is one action at the same time there are other actions like uh, we are using lot of the thermoset or the thermoplast components in our manufacturing and we do the landfill like we used to do the uh, landfill uh, huge landfill earlier which was in impacting environment so now uh, you know we are giving it to a cement industry where they are basically recycling it and uh, that is helping for their product and uh, this is not creating a impact on the environment as well so now for for these kind of actions you know you don't need digital there are many such kind of simple actions where uh, we have to make the action plans inside our manufacturing process like uh, we we used to have lots of pad printing and the inkjet printing operations like uh, printing the barcode through inkjet printing or through pad printing where we have a you know consumption of the ink the chemicals the thinners so those kind of things the consumption was quite high it was also an environmental issue also it was a operator related issue uh, because they used to inhale and you know it used to impact their health now today i will say that uh, we don't have we have converted all those technologies so basically moving from uh, like bat to non bat we have converted all those technologies through laser printing today we have invested huge capex to do that but also we have recover, we have we have a good roi uh, we have improved the labor productivity with with those advanced solutions so these are you know other automation related actions or the simple conventional actions in combi- in combination with uh, the digital or the smart actions through which we all can work together on sustainability great Raul, thank you. Thank you so much for those insights and what you're doing at Schneider. 
Um, so Shrikanta, quickly, if you have any any views on that, and then I do have a follow-up question uh, for you as well, which uh, which relates to, you know, in, in the light of the innovation and, uh, you know, the changes which have been brought about in the industry, in the way we are working, how, how do you see this impacting the need for reskilling of the labor or reskilling of the the human resources. We we've been talking about the you know uh, resources. How do we utilize them best? And and human resources are the most important ones. So how do you see that? You know what would be the impact on the the need for reskilling or the new skills for the uh, for those resources? Yeah. Thank you for that question. Possibly I will touch up on uh, sustainability first, uh, maybe from Bosch angle. Uh, Bosch is one of the global uh, organization which has already reached climate neutrality since 2020. Uh, as an organization, we play a pioneering role in climate action. Uh, actually, our board of directors say that when it comes to climate change, words are not enough, we have to take action. So there are four levers of climate neutrality on which Bosch is acting. Uh, one is in terms of energy efficiency, whereby we reduce the energy being consumed in our manufacturing plants and as well as the buildings and other offices. We have an audacious goal of uh, saving around 1.7 terawatt hours of energy by making energy efficiency improvements. Uh, this could be utilizing many of our energy management solutions. Uh, so that you monitor the energy being consumed and you try to save it. Uh, possibly there are at least 1,000 such projects going on in the Bosch world currently. And uh, from uh, Bosch India, we have a solution which we call it as Bosch Deep Sites. Uh, this solution is uh, based on uh, from the right now, from the connectivity layer, you can connect all your uh, utilities, you can connect your machines, you can connect the wages that is water, gas, energy, solar, all these things, take up the data and possibly visualize the data, find out where are your consumption points. Uh, try to also, uh, we have a set of 50 odd KPIs which we have built like cost per part, uh, spike of the energy happening, you can identify them. And we've also built in around 100 odd uh, asset based analytical models. So that suppose you have an HVAC, we have built an asset model for it. Uh, you have a boiler, we have built an asset model for it. So based on this AI based model, the moment you connect such an asset, it immediately tells you, it starts giving you business insights in terms of what all you need to do to improve or reduce the energy consumption and to improve energy efficiency. Uh, so this product has been tried out in uh, most of the Bosch brands in India. We have got a portal where we look at the energy efficiency happening and then we are now offering it to our uh, customers. And in order to encourage our customers into getting into sustainability area, we also do a consultancy where we promise beforehand how much energy can be saved after doing a energy audit in this company. And then we implement this solution and prove our promise. And most of these projects we take up on the energy efficiency, we do it an outcome-based model. Uh, that means suppose we promise that we can save you 5% of your energy bills this year. Uh, we implement deep sites and show you those 5% and then only take the project money or the savings money. So uh, that is the amount of uh, emphasis Bosch gives for energy neutrality or climate neutrality. And the other things Bosch is doing is it's investing heavily on the new clean power that is on the renewable side. So most of our uh, energy needs, uh, we are by 2030, uh, the aim is to generate around 0.4 terawatt hour of the energy. Uh, by investing in renewable sources, uh, especially inside our plants, we use mostly solar. And also uh, in Germany, they use a lot of wind farms for getting this energy. So the complete uh, orientation is, is towards going to new clean power. And we also have a plan of getting into carbon offsets as a bridging solution to something which is unavoidable consumption of uh, energy. So that's the way uh, Bosch is progressing. And uh, uh, we are... Uh, already climate neutral as per an auditing agency. So uh, in 2020 itself, we achieved it. So that's about that's the sustainability great. journey of Bosch. Now coming to the skill sets side, I think this is a very interesting solution. I mean, interesting question. Uh, because many a times uh, when we talk of Industry 4.0, people come with a counterpoint telling that Industry 4.0 will lead to loss of jobs. 
Uh, I would like to rather uh, recount an anecdote. Around 20 years back, I was uh, in a company called as Panu, which used to supply robots uh, into manufacturing companies. And when, when we used to evangelize robot selling, the same argument was coming up. Normally, whenever new technology happens, uh, you don't lose jobs. Rather, you need to reskill and get it to the new higher value addition jobs. So there was no jobs for robot maintenance people, robot programming people, robot calibration people, but you have and robot sales people. There were no such jobs where before robot came into picture. So even though robots would replace a person on the operator level or something, he can get reskilled and be deployed as a maintenance person of a robot, or he can get into a value addition. So it's not risk uh, losing of jobs, but rather reskilling and getting into new jobs. That's what happens. Even industry 4.0, the same thing is going to happen. And the other thing is most of the industry 4.0 solutions are focused on enabling operator or enabling people. So for example, if you take an ARVR, what is ARVR finally telling you? It is going to make a maintenance technician do his job more efficiently, or it's going to make the operator come to how to operate a complex machines even without an expert help. So most of the industry 4.0 technologies help in enabling the operator, human is being at the center of the thing. And wherever uh, there is a chance of losing jobs, you basically have to reskill and get into the next job. And that's how normally new technologies play out. Thank you. Yeah, very, very, very true. Very true. I think that's that's uh, everywhere. The need of the hour is to rescale and uh, focus on the new skills and let the the redundant uh, work or the um, yeah, the the repetitive work be automated and done by the machines. Uh, but uh, that brings us another very interesting question. And uh, Sudhish would like to have your view on that. Um, you know, whenever somebody in my team tells me that I want to focus on artificial intelligence, I say, what about the natural intelligence, <laughs> right? So, so how, how do you see that conflict between the, the human intelligence where, you know, I just know based on my experience or whatever that this needs to be done versus where the, there is a machine intelligence where we say that, you know, now, we, now you really need to have these smart machines where you have the smart environment. And then... If I if I just stretch it a little bit further um, and take a flight of an imagination and say that you know uh, one day the the hackers are gonna take over all your the the shop floor, right? And uh, and you know that that's it, it brings in a lot of elements of your security, your cyber security, your data security, your privacy issues, and you you open yourself up to a whole gamut of those issues which were earlier unheard of when you were dealing with the mechanical world or factory. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think it's a very interesting journey to be in to say how human intelligence and natural intelligence are correlating around and, uh, and hacking and others is obviously the connotation of natural intelligence being dominating the machine intelligence and that's that's the whole story from there on so let me take two uh, conflicting thoughts here and so that you really see uh, the perspective on how this human intelligence and machine intelligence are really working hand in hand to really create a difference so uh, when we go to any factory basically there would be usually a, a very wise man sitting there with 20 years experience, 25 years of experience and looking, just hearing the sound of the machine, he really understands, okay, this is the real problem and you pretty much uh, do this action and you are done with it. And, uh, and I think the aging factor, the pandemic has all really created that stress on it saying that, yeah, everybody is vulnerable and that intelligence uh, which is there on uh, that show floor has now gradually getting lost or wiped out or uh, truncated for various reasons. And the fundamental thing each of us, uh, I think, has still not really focused into that part is that person has got that intelligence because there's too much of data in his head. And that data is basically getting manifested itself as an intelligence over the period of time. And that's what is really using it, correct? To make that informed decision. Now, unless each of everybody in the system or ecosystem understands that basic construct, that it is the data which has helped that person to be more intelligent and experienced to make that happen. And 
yeah, human brain is much more powerful. But yeah, I think the machines can be much more powerful than that if we consolidate and focus on that data part of the story around it. So that's the first part of the whole journey, saying that natural intelligence and human intelligence are coming to that convergence layer when uh, when you look at from that data angle and say that, okay, it is when you are talking about industry 4.0 and everybody else, you are only talking about that intelligence being captured either in the system, which was previously in the human mind. And the focus has to be clearly done because humans are perishable. And at one point of time, uh, you really need that uh, knowledge captured somewhere and reutilized around it. And the, the only way to do is you, you bring that into a data asset and store it out, which will then become for eternal uh, because that intelligence is what is going to drive us to take our journey forward to create an autonomous system eventually. So, because everybody, uh, if you look at uh, from a labor market or anybody, nobody wants to do the mundane stuff. Earlier, it was easier to get in labor and say, okay, do this work. And But as the generation is moving to the next level, people are also understanding that there is not too much value in doing the same work again and again. And that kind of uh, human population is going to go down. And that's where the humans has to get replaced at that segment to the next level of machines. And for that to happen, you need to have that data coming in and that intelligence flowing in through the system. So that's the first part of the uh, discussion around to look at it. The second part is when many people talk about, okay, with machines, intelligence coming in, humans are not required. And so I, I go back to the same point to say that that person who was intelligent on the shop floor has too much information. So he is a valuable asset. He cannot be replaced. The more the value which needs to be done is to convert that intelligence into a system. He needs to upskill himself to be that person who brings that uh, intelligence into a digital system. And that's what the, I think the most of the people on the floor are not really able to understand the true value for themselves. When they say they are getting replaced, it is because they are not realizing the human capital they have onto it and bringing that value onto the table to create that value on the ecosystem. So that's the second part of the story, which I really want people to know about it. When people say machine, humans are replacing machine. No, it's not. Humans are not re, um, getting replaced at all. It is that uh, you need to really upskill yourself to just... Uh, uh, take it to the next generation using your knowledge which you have acquired of it because we have acquired too much data in our head right now. So that's the second part. Now come to the third part of it, which is once you digitize and make the system autonomous, obviously uh, the threats on uh, the malicious element always comes in because human minds are uh, really malicious and uh, we don't like uh, to sit idle. So that's kind of where the whole uh, thing comes in. So it's going to come and people want to leverage the technology to threat others and so on. So I think security is going to be a concern and whatever you do, uh, you need to literally look at uh, uh, cybersecurity as a primary construct in the whole new world of era. Because once you make things connected, it is obviously that somebody more intelligent will be able to come into the system and do what he wants to do around it. So, so as you go pass through that journey, uh, the fundamental thing which I still always look at is control systems has to be isolated. You cannot have a uh, seamless integrated control system and autonomous controlling remotely. The, whatever you do, whatever security you put in place, there will be the next guy who comes in and you will make that uh, punch a hole into that system. So, so the from a manufacturing and especially on the kind of the thing, isolation is the primary strategy around that. And I think uh, while there are many remediation, cryptography and so on, ideas are there, but irrespective of all that, uh, the only bulletproof solution to that is isolation and I think that that's the holy grail which people will eventually realize that uh, a technology can go only so far 
beyond that it is uh, common sense finally which will prevail and isolation is the only way to make that happen because uh, you can't beat the system and you can't assume that there will be not the next generation genius who will come and punch a hole irrespective of what you do right absolutely absolutely right on couldn't agree with you more you know on on these aspects and i think you know this this is a this is a great discussion and i would i would love to continue for another hour but unfortunately i, I think we are we are running out of time and i do want to um, spare some time for any q and a uh, towards the end so um uh, to all the participants if you have questions uh, we need i think they can just unmute themselves and ask the questions and you can i, I think there have been few on the chat as well uh, there is been few on the chat and participants you can raise your hand and we can allow you to talk to ask the question so while there uh, in the meantime i'll ask one of the question which is on the chat uh the question is we are living in the time of uh, where data is being collected everywhere how do we manage and handle the vast amount of data i think so that would be a very easy question now yeah normally okay. should i take it yeah yeah please Uh, see, normally in Industry 4.0, uh, the very essence is the data. Data is the oil, and uh, manufacturing was uh, an area where data was not acquired and stored and analyzed earlier. And with Industry 4.0 coming, the bedrock uh, formula is to acquire all the valuable manufacturing data for analysis. So then you have a humongous amount of data which needs to be stored, analyzed, and possibly computed. Uh, so that is where cloud is the obvious solution for it, which gives you a flexible data storage, flexible computing, and even it offers you a lot of analytics tools, which is possible on the cloud. Uh, having said that, uh, before embarking on industry for digital journey, normally we advise clients to get into an enterprise level architecture consultancy, where you can really see how you need to acquire data. Uh, and what are the ways of acquiring data and uh, there are things like hot stream of data cold stream of data what data needs to go where and uh, it's not always uh, advised that everything you acquire you send it to cloud because your cloud charges also will uh, increase so there are and there are reasons where you need immediate action uh, with less latency then you need data to be at the edge and you need to compute and analyze and take action on it and historical data data huge data which Needs to be analyzed should be sent to the cloud. So you need a proper architecture for building this entire data acquisition, storage, and analytics. Thank you, Srikant. Raul, you 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 have something to add to that? No, mostly, I think Srikant has already answered. Maybe I will just add one point that today we have the the business intelligence, uh, the dashboards, the Tableau dashboards. We have the leap tools. so normally yes as shrikant mentioned data is oil so okay today we are capturing lot of data but what to do with that data so again uh, that's a question mark so this bi dashboards today uh, uh, will help us uh, as shrikant was mentioning we have to make an architecture how do we want to see the data so that is what uh, uh, the team has to make a architecture that make a wireframe how do we we have a data but how should we see that data and what is the right wire frame or a right architecture which will enable us for deriving the right action and the right root cause uh, findings so that is what uh, we will have to uh, we will have to make so that uh, you you know we can utilize that data which is already captured at edge level and we have a, we have you know 100% utilization of that data and it should help us for the decision making and also like we should also work in future that uh, how this data will also uh, you know make the action plan himself so working on the further analytics that you know even that should not be manual dependent you define uh, the the program the algorithm the parameters in such a way that the data will also take the self decision maybe today we are not uh, quite advanced in that area from schneider point of view but um, like that is what is the game plan in future that uh, the data lake also should take the uh, the self decision for the uh, for the identified action thank you okay before we move on to the next question uh, i request everyone to share the feedback of the webinar uh, in the link shared and uh, 
over to the next question now uh, is this has been asked by mr kishore his question is how to develop information processing model to embed uh, natural intelligence okay possibly i can take it for maybe the other colleagues over here uh, panelists can also respond uh, see many of the times when you build an analytical model uh, the initial thing is you are actually mimicking natural intelligence i think sudesh was also mentioning it sometime back so you need to understand possibly how a process is working what are the variables involved let us say i take a quality process and inspection process you need to know what are the variables which are required to make a product good or bad and how these variables in a uh, total affect the final outcome so this is basically natural intelligence but then where uh, computers overpower is in terms of the amount of data you can crunch so as a natural intelligence we have a limit in terms of huge data crunching that is where computation will help you so that suppose you want to analyze let us say the past two years of historical data and find out what are the outlying trends or find out what are the things which really caused problems then you need a computer to help you but then the basic problem at hand basic analysis should be always done with a human brain so that's where uh, even when we build analytical models for problems like quality scrap reduction energy improvement initially we actually take uh, the domain experts help or the subject matter experts in that area who can tell what is this problem all about what are the various parameters and things which can affect this uh, outcome and based on that the analytical model gets built using the computing power or the crunching thing so it is always uh, a natural intelligence starts first and then we get into computing to make it in a bigger scale and make it to crunch maybe higher amounts of data possibly the others so, can also add on so i'll just give a little radical difference on how natural intelligence and machine intelligence differ around so if you look at natural intelligence uh, the crunching power is far superior than the machines uh, because we uh, as humans process it based on uh, heuristics and yeah uh, what i call as inferences and so on and the ability to navigate through that huge vast amount of historical information is quite high now what machines gives you is a deterministic way of evaluating to the final outcome where you crunch every bit of probability and you calculate and you finally come to the outcome so there are two traditional ones is you guarantee an outcome using a machine by crunching all sort of it versus a human which is able to crunch that same intelligence or information in a much more faster way and i think it goes back to how data is represented in our human brain as such because we don't capture every bit of detail in our head it's more about the uh, the required intelligence is what is stored so somebody was asking how do you store all this uh, for industry for data in the data and manage all this data it goes back to the same thing if we mimic how the human intelligence is storing the data it is not storing every garbage data out there it is storing the intelligence it is storing the inferences it is storing that patterns which is basically helping you recover so when you come to the large data world you will eventually come to the same story that you cannot store every bit of data any time and crunch it because you will just waste machines you will just waste the processing power you need to find intelligent ways to do this and this uh, i think yeah many of the big companies are already doing it for example i had talked to my facebook friend some day back and says that okay facebook gets so much millions of data are they storing everything no they can't store the whole thing what they do is they at that speed of arrival of data they actually make inferences on what really makes sense out of it and capture that and stores that out because that's the only way you can make uh, use of the data as it the volume expands around so so fundamentally looking back we need to understand that the human processor is much more powerful than the machine processor machine is only dumb it just keeps doing the whole thing and you keep throwing 
big uh, energy onto it and you just waste wasting energy uh, there should be a much more intelligent way on how you organize your information and hence you are obviously your processing power will more true so this is a different radical way i didn't wanted to contradict anything it is my view on how i see perceive things it's more about how you organize the data which is going to really change the world uh, going forward because the information is going to just flood from here on uh, mr mesh you have a question so please uh, ask yes, a sir. question right uh, thank you for the opportunity sir uh, this is a new thing for me to you know interact with the people like you all and uh, like industry 4.1 and uh, you are saying sustainability uh, it's a great thing that industry people are doing to contribute to co control the air pollution and uh, you know to control the environmental pollution as a whole uh, uh, in a general point of view you know i have attended multiple conferences and seminars and i'm working in a college and we will discuss only the theoretical aspects rather than you know approaching the field uh, seeing the field conditions so you are uh, you have already mentioned uh, rahul sir has mentioned they have already in place uh, with some uh, energy and water monitoring things and uh, you know why can't we have these things uh, in, a, in a holistic way like you know uh, we can contribute to the country as a whole uh, to reduce the air pollution you know delhi and kolkata like developed cities are there which are having highly polluted uh, also of course uh, we have a scarcity of water so we can monitor these things as well Uh, why can't uh, what is there as uh, what is there that uh, which is stopping us uh, in monitoring and bringing out a solution for this? Uh, Mahesh, Maybe. possibly from my side, I will tell. Uh, from Bosch, we had developed a solution called as Climo uh, or a pollution monitoring and uh, uh, measuring solution. Uh, it's a it was a box with uh, sensors fitted for uh, uh, checking out or monitoring various gases and pollutants. so we had successfully deployed in many of our plants we are also in talks with uh, uh, bbmp that is the bangalore uh, corporation to supply it and put it across different parts of the uh, city uh, you have such uh, monitoring and uh, uh, possibly indicating solutions uh, even in uh, many cities in uh, europe so industries are trying to help the society in terms of uh, uh, improving the sustainability area Uh, we also have solutions which can help in detecting water leakage gas leakage uh, improvising your uh, renewable energy area uh, only thing is i think uh, society as a whole needs to walk towards it it's not only the industries the people concerned uh, possibly the leaders uh, the bureaucrats general public everybody should join hand in hand i think right now if you ask me there is quite a positive bit of enthusiasm all around towards uh, the sustainability journey so i think uh, people are walking towards it um, maybe taking example of india but i think the government is putting a lot of efforts already on this front and maybe not not maybe you know just this year or last year but maybe from last 4 5 years i will say like i as uh, uh, srikant was mentioning today and in a layman's language today if you have to buy a new car there is a thought which comes in our mind that you know let can i buy a electric vehicle today at least that thought comes today maybe all the people are not, not opting for it but still there are one or two percent of the people who are telling that you know i will go for a electric car only so that thought process is getting invoked now the of course there is a lack of certain infrastructure for um, many things but at least uh, there is a road map and uh, the things will evolve accordingly but today if we say that you know earlier we used to have many uh, the tolls on the roads and uh, the manual connection of cash and all those things now with pandemic or even before pandemic also everywhere we are you know we have the, all the e pay systems today we earlier maybe i used to keep 1000 rupees as a cash in my wallet always now normally i don't keep it and mostly it's the same with most of the people so we are leveraging on the digital payment and it has you know started just in last two years time and it will further evolve so you are a smart city so one example naya raichur so naya raichur uh, is a project which was taken by schneider and um, uh, in that city today we have the the electrical vehicles as a transportation system uh, there are digital meters for the water tracking installed in each and every home uh, the power consumption real time tracking 
and those kind of systems are already in place and uh, within india we have identified already the smart city launch plan so by by bjp government uh, they are already working on that particular deployment solar roofing five years down the line we never had solar roof and we used to leverage the electrical energy only for heating the water solutions and all but today in most of the buildings like you know we have solar roofs uh, plastic bag usage so today at 90% of the shops the plastic bags are banned and government is encouraging the the usage of recyclable plastics cng was not a experiment like succeed experiment but they, maybe it was also a experiment which was done by the government usage of biogas so there are many examples so maybe maybe we cannot say that uh, in the real world things are not happening maybe the progress is little slow but uh, 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 there is a road map and maybe in coming 5 years maybe it will evolve to the right level thank you mr rahul and mr shikanta uh, if there is any more question please ask we have time for only one question now okay seems there are no other questions so i remind audience to please uh, uh, please fill up the feedback form and uh, uh, to follow more uh, uh, about t hub please check out our various social media sites uh, we are available on linkedin twitter or uh, instagram and uh, facebook and uh, with that i'd like to thank uh, all the panelists and special thanks to mr avnesh bhatnaga for wonderfully moderating the session thank you mr srikanta adarya for joining us thank you sudesh and thank you rahul thank you thank you everyone thanks everybody thank you avnesh looking Especially forward to physically you. meeting you at tfs uh, sometime absolutely thank you, yeah. you amnish thanks vinit thanks uh, the panelists thanks t hub for organizing thank this thank you very much thank you, thank you everyone bye bye